This morning, I want to speak to you about the presence of God and about the subject of revival. We have had, in this country and other countries around the world, over the the centuries, a number of times when God has stirred people's hearts. He has revived the church, revitalized the church. People's passion for God has grown. And it's turned into a a, a change in society. People have come to faith in their hundreds and thousands. uh, And transformations have happened in uh, social transformation, in the the fabric of society. In this country, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, uh, in the States, in Europe. And um, one of the uh, experts in revival... Uh, was a, a professor in the States uh, called Edwin Orr. And in 19, Dr. Edwin Orr, 1940, he took a group of his students over to England to go and visit the place where John Wesley, very involved in the 18th century revival, uh, grew up and spent some of his life. Uh, and it was in a, a rectory, a, a church, a house in Epworthy. And they visited this house, and by the bed in John Wesley's room were these two patches of carpet which were um, imprinted with knee marks. And it was said that that is where John Wesley had knelt every day and prayed that God would renew his church and would send revival to the country. And... The students saw the, the, uh, the room, and then they went out, they got on the bus, and the professor suddenly realized that one of the students was missing. And he went back into the house and found one student kneeling in the kneel marks on the bed, and he was praying. And he was praying this, Lord, do it again. Lord, do it again. And that student was Billy Graham. And Billy Graham, as you many will you'll know, that he died this year, age of 99, perhaps the greatest evangelist ever, certainly of the 20th century, spoke to more people in person than anyone else about Jesus, over 210 million people in person, and his heart was, Lord, do it again, and God did it again. And as I read about Billy Graham this week, something stirred in me again, and made me want to pray for our time, for our country right now, Lord, do it again. Send revival. Bring life back to your church. Bring life to this nation. Bring people to Jesus. That's what I'm longing for. That's the heart of this church. Uh, That You know, the vision statement of this church is revival, the re-evangelization of this nation, the revitalization of the church, and the transformation of society. And the question is, how can we pray for revival? How can we be involved personally. You know that old song, Send Revival, Start With Me. How do we get involved in that today? And our passage today is from Exodus. We're going through the book of Exodus. So if you'd like to have a look, uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 33, starting at verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard this, these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. And then on to verse 7. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And then on to verse 11. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young assistant Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. But if you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? 
What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, show me your glory. What one thing, if you had it in your life, would make your life feel complete? If there's one thing that you could ask for and have that would make you feel like life was, you were there, you reached it. Maybe it's getting a great degree. You're a student at the moment. Maybe it's owning your own business. Maybe it's planting your own church or meeting that special someone or hitting 10,000 followers on Instagram or starting a family or getting a promotion at work or your baby sleeping through the night or maybe it's as simple as the reopening of your local KFC. What is the thing that would make your life feel complete? Well, for Moses, it was the promised land. God had promised his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and himself to lead them into the promised land. That's why they left Egypt in the first place, was to go to the promised land. And here, God is promising exactly that. Verse 1, Moses said, the Lord said to Moses, leave this place. And go to the land I promised you on oath to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will drive out the Canaanites and all the others. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. This is the fulfillment of everything that Moses has ever wanted. But there's one catch. Verse 3, but I will not go with you. What would you do? God is offering you the very thing you have longed for all of your life. Would you take the deal? You get the degree. You get your business. You get your thriving church, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your Instagram followers, the family you've longed for, but you don't get God. Would you take that deal? Well, Moses says, no deal. I don't accept that deal. He says, if your presence, verse 15, if your presence does not go with us, don't send us up from here. Part of me is thinking, come on, Moses, this is what you've always wanted. Take it. You only get one shot, like Eminem said. Do not miss your chance to blow. The opportunity comes once in a lifetime, yo. (laughs) Take the deal, Moses. But Moses doesn't take the deal. Why? Because he's experienced in his life the presence of God. And nothing is worth more than that. He is willing to sacrifice everything he's always longed for so that he can have the presence of God. What are we talking about when we talk about the presence of God? Well, in one sense, God is everywhere. He is present everywhere. He's omnipresent. Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence, uh, from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Answer, nowhere. God is everywhere. But there's a difference between God's general presence and his personal presence. Knowing that God is with you. Having a sense of his presence with you. So, uh, by way of illustration, uh, as Stephen said, uh, uh, five weeks ago, we welcomed into the world Barnaby David Zachary Flint. And um, uh, he's a brilliant little guy. Uh, He's actually sitting, I say sitting, lying. He's fast asleep over there. The thing about Barney, though, is that Jill, my wife, the last five weeks, Friday, this Friday, when he was turned five weeks old, was the first day that Jill hasn't been with him 24-7. She had an hour off, and I looked after Barney. But all that time, Jill has never left his presence, and he's never been out of the presence of Jill. Even if it's in another room, she has always been there. She has been, in one sense, to him, omnipresent. But there are these moments when he needs her, particularly. He needs food or changing or a cuddle. In fact, quite a lot of times he needs those things. And at those points, Jill will pick him up and he will know the personal presence. And it's like that God in these moments picks us up 
and says, I know you, I love you, I'm there for you, I am with you. That is the personal presence that Moses had experienced and that we can experience. Now, obviously, at the beginning of the Bible, uh, Adam and Eve, they had the personal presence of God with them the whole time. And at the end of the Bible, we see in Revelation that we will never be out of the presence, personal presence of God. Uh, in fact, I, there was this quote from Billy Graham um, I love. Someday you'll read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't believe a word of it. I shall be more alive than I am now. I will have changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of God. He is in the presence of God, the personal presence of God. So at the beginning of the Bible, that's the case. At the end of the story, that's the case. What about now? Well, in the Old Testament, uh, because of sin and the fall and people's rebellion against God, uh, his personal presence only was available to certain people at particular times in particular places. Moses was one of them. Jesus came. Jesus, who was God with us, the presence of God in bodily form, in human form. And he, wherever he was, the presence of God, the personal presence of God was. And when he died, he broke the barrier between us, removing our sins so that we could know the personal presence of God for ourselves. And then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out, and everyone experiences that personal presence. So we live in an amazing time. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we can experience, just like Moses the personal presence of God. So the question is, how? How do we experience that? And I want to draw out three quick things from this passage. The first is this. Get real. Get real. Get honest about where you are at, at the moment, in your relationship with God. You know, any uh, business review any management review, leadership review, even a personal review. We're doing a 360 review at the moment as a part of our team. Uh, and sometimes it's a bit painful what you hear back. But actually, it's also liberating because it defines reality. You know where you are. You want to get over here, but you know where you're starting from. Same with this. Be honest. Where are you at with God at the moment? Are you experiencing the personal presence of God with you? Do you sense at the moment God speaking to you and what he's saying? Do you sense that you're walking step by step in close relationship with him? Well, if the answer is yes, fantastic. Go for it. Keep going. If the answer is mm, not so sure, well, congratulations, you are a Christian. That is the experience of Christians down the ages. We sometimes think, you know what, I've got to have this amazing experience of God all the way through my life. In fact, if you're thinking, I don't know what you're talking about, not having the presence of God, you must be a new Christian. You must have just experienced that. Because if anyone's been a Christian for a certain amount of time, you will know that it's not always like that. That's what happens. It's a little bit like the um, second law of thermodynamics, uh, which you will probably experience through having a cup of coffee from Pret or any other place. When you start your cup of coffee, you drink it, and it scolds your mouth so badly that you can't drink anymore. But within a few minutes, it's lukewarm, and you throw it away. That is the second law of thermodynamics, that any system that is not attended to will naturally disintegrate and uh, become more diverse, diffuse, and will deteriorate. And it's the same with our spiritual lives. There is a law of pneumodynamics, which is that unattended to, our spiritual temperature will begin to fall. And that's what he says to the people in, uh, God says to the people. He says, I'll not go with you. Why? Because you are a stiff-necked people. In other words, you are totally reliant on yourself. Stiff-necked is, is that sense of, you know, when you bow down, you you bend your neck. Stiff necked is, no, I've got it all together. I'll be fine on my own. Thank you very much. And actually, we tend towards that. And yet God constantly wants to draw us back into his presence, to draw us closer to him, to heat the fire again. And maybe you're here and you're not a Christian and you're thinking, this is really interesting. I thought that the Christian faith was about believing a certain set of doctrines or conforming to a certain set of uh, values or behaviors. 
But actually, what I'm beginning to hear now is that it is much more dynamic than that. It's like a relationship. It's something personal that ebbs and flows. And maybe you're a Christian and you're thinking, you know what? I, I've known this in the past, the presence of God. But you know, if I'm really honest at the moment, I'm not feeling it so much. Well, as I said, that is totally normal and totally natural. But the great news, news is we can all do something about it. So firstly, get real. Where are you at in the moment? Secondly, get rid of the stuff in your life that is causing your, the presence of God to be more difficult to grasp. What is the stuff that has filled your life that is becoming more important than God? Verse 4, this is what the people did. It says, when they heard these distressing words, they began to mourn. They mourn. You know you mourn when something is lost. Something you've had, but you've lost. If you had that sense, even a small sense this morning, that, oh, I, I remember the presence of God, but I, I'm really sad that it's not as strong as it, it was then. You know what? If you're mourning that, that is an amazing sign that you are spiritually alive. If you weren't spiritually alive, you wouldn't care. You'd be like, oh, fine, whatever, I'll just get on with my life. The very fact that you're here today, the very fact that your heart is mourning, that longing for that, means that you are spiritually alive, and the Lord just wants to bring those embers back to life in you today. So they mourned, and then secondly, it says they stripped off their ornaments. Why? Well, because the ornaments were what they had melted down to make the golden calf. You know how short their memories were? They'd been taken through the Red Sea. They'd had this amazing experience of God. They couldn't believe it could get any better. Within a very short space of time, uh, the law of pneumodynamics meant that they lost their spiritual passion. They forgot about God, and they started to create their own idols. And at this moment, when they hear that God, God's presence is on the line, they say, you know what? I don't want anything to get in the way of me and God. I'm going to take off my ornaments. I'm going to get rid of the idols. And maybe God is saying that to you today. Is there something that has jumped up in front of God that actually is causing you to lose the presence of God? What is it? Maybe it's one of those things we talked, to about, we talked about earlier. Uh, you know, the thing about idols is they promise much and they deliver very little. They promise happiness. They say, if you do this, you will be happy. If you put 15 years into your career, non-stop working really hard, above me, above everything else, you will be happy. They can't deliver. If you find that one person in your life that you, you, you think you can really connect with, that will make you happy. Cannot deliver. None of them can. You know what? The only thing that can transform your life from the inside out is the presence of God. And sometimes people say, you know what, the presence of God, um, will it make me happy? Well, yes, but it's so much more than that. It's a little bit like the Olympics. So imagine, I don't know if you've been watching any of the Winter Olympics. Uh, Barney and I have been watching a lot of Olympics together at about three in the morning every single day for the last five weeks. Um, but it's amazing. You see these people who, uh, a couple of times, when someone has won a medal and they haven't been expecting it at all, and they get onto the podium and they, they are so overcome with emotion and excitement and everything that it just gets to them and they, they break down in tears and, and they're just weeping and happy and crying, you know, all this sort of stuff. And imagine if someone comes up to them and says, are you having fun? They'd be like, well... Yeah, kind of, but it's, it's a little bit more than that. It's a bit more dramatic than that. It's so much deeper and wider and more extraordinary and more powerful. It's a bit like that with the presence of God. Would it make you happy? Well, yeah, kind of, but it's a bit more than that. It's so much more profound and deep and life-changing. You know, in, in the Psalms, the psalmist says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. You know, the fullness of God, fullness of joy is that sense that I don't need to look anywhere else I am satisfied with you and your presence. So, get real. Where are you at with God this morning? Get rid of anything that you feel like is getting in the way between you and God. And lastly, and thirdly, get ready. Get ready for the presence of God. Get ready for what God is going to do in your life. Verse 7. 
Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp, some distance away, calling it the Tent of Meeting. Great name. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the Tent of Meeting outside the camp. God had said, you know, I'm not going to dwell with you, with, with you inside the camp. So Moses said, right, well, I'm going to go to you. I'm going to go wherever I can find the presence of God. He set up a little tent. Didn't really, wasn't something special or dramatic. But in there, he was on his knees like Billy Graham saying, Lord, do it again. Send your presence. And what they describe is that the presence of God came down. What I love is that he took matters into his own hands and said, you know what, I know the presence of God is the best thing for me and these people. In fact, it's the best thing for the whole world. So I am going to do everything I can to get there. And God is calling us to say, do you want my presence? Will you do anything it takes to get there? What do you want me? I want to change things in your life. Will you respond to my call? Go outside the camp. Do something different. Innovate. Change. Whatever you need to do. You know, sometimes people say, you know what, I don't really pray because I don't really get very much from it. Well, that may be the case. But if you keep going, if you do something different, if you seek God, his promise is you will find him if you seek him with all your heart. So what does it mean for you to get ready? What does it mean for you to go outside the camp to do something new, to say, Lord, I want to experience your presence in a new way in my life. It's Lent. This is a great opportunity. We're getting ready for Easter. This is a great opportunity to say, Lord, I want to know your presence. I, I actually texted my Connect group and said, has anyone given up anything for Lent? And have you experienced anything as a result? Uh, one person, Tash, wrote this to me. said, um, I haven't given anything, anything up, but I've taken 40 days of listening prayer. I have a writer's pad and pen. I sit with God for five minutes minimum and say, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm here. Please speak to me. Then I wait on God and write down anything that comes to mind. It's the second time I've done it, and it is transformative in capital letters. It gives a framework and discipline I don't get from my work. It is such an amazing thing. Maybe that's something you could try. Maybe it's as simple as going to the 24-7 prayer room. You know, we have our own tent of meeting, the other side of the car park, very glamorous, uh, little hut. But you know what? You can book in an hour in there. I, I started doing that about a year and a half ago. I book in one hour every week in the morning. You know what? It has transformed my life. It's transformed the way I see things. And you go in there, and I don't know what it is about that place. I don't really have a theological explanation, but you go in there and you sense the presence of God. People have been praying there. It's amazing. Maybe that's something you could do. Maybe it's the Alpha weekend. I don't know if you're on Alpha at the moment. I know we've got hundreds of people in the evening and the morning on Alpha. The Alpha weekend is a chance to go outside the camp, do something different, to experience the presence of God. I always think of um, Neil. About a year ago, Neil came on Alpha. Uh, 20-something-year-old guy working in the city, life and soul of the party, great guy, uh, not a Christian, and he came on Alpha, got to the week. Everyone was saying, do you want to come on the weekend? He said, no, I can't come. Um, so people were saying, oh, you know, how come you can't come? And he said, basically, I've, I've got work drinks on the Friday night, so I don't think I can come. And Stephen, his group leader, said, well, um, you could just come after the drinks. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. They're work drinks. Um, I'm not going to come on the Friday night, and I won't be coming on Saturday either. <laughs> and Stephen said, well, why don't you just try do something a bit different. Try, why don't you go to the drinks for a bit and then come down? So he said, oh, okay, I'll try it. Try something different. So he came down on the Friday night. He loved it. He got on great with the group, had a great time. Saturday night, he encountered Jesus for himself. And he was filled with the presence of God. The Holy Spirit transformed his heart and his life. He became a Christian. Uh, he came back. He got involved in the next course. He is now up in Edinburgh leading Alpha in his church in Edinburgh. You know what I love about this passage is it ends with Moses saying, show me your glory. We spend a lot of time thinking about our glory, don't we? I do. But actually, in this moment, experiencing the presence of God, he says, I want to see your glory. And you know what? In this time, in this moment, in this country, I long 
to experience personally more of the presence of God. I hope you do too, because I think if we do this, the knock-on effect will be huge. We will have an impact on our families, on our communities, on our businesses. We'll have an impact on those around us. As Moses said, people will see the difference. And I really believe if we encounter the presence of God, we will see the re-evangelization of this nation. We will see the revitalization of the church. And we will see the transformation of society. In Jesus' name. Amen.